This is Chad Post from Open Letter Books, and this is the Two Month Review, a weekly podcast in which we talk about a single book, section by section, bit by bit, week after week. Um, and we are currently talking about Gorgi Gospodinov's The Physics of Sorrow, which was translated by Andrew Rodell from the Bulgarian, and which we've been working through over the past, I believe, eight episodes now, or this is episode seven, I think, episode seven. So. <laughs> Um, and we'll get into the book in a second, but I wanted to do some quick housekeeping things. Um, first off, if you are listening to this either on YouTube or as a podcast, I would really appreciate it if you go and subscribe and give us a rating. Um, they'll help more people find the podcast, especially as we head into our next season. Um, and speaking of that, our next season is going to be with featuring Dubrovsky Ugrushik, um, whose book Fox is the one that we'll be talking about. It's brand new. It technically, technically comes out next Tuesday, um, or Tuesday after that, I forget, the 17th of this month, which I think is the right date, whatever, around the 17th of April. And it has already received three starred reviews in Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, and Library Journal. So it's a great book, a lot of people talking about it, a lot of buzz going. So we're gonna sort of seize on that and get into that book in probably the end of May. We'll have a full schedule soon. But in the meantime, pick up a copy of Fox by Dubrovsky and Grushik. The last thing I wanted to say is, for anyone listening to this, you may have um, heard, I mean, you may just be a listener to the podcast or someone who watches it on YouTube. And we also have weekly posts that are going up on 3% that are written by Arisa Santiago Maurice, who is a PhD student at the University of Rochester. He's been reading along with the book, watching all of the, the YouTube podcasts or listening to these and is being able to write like long in-depth articles about the particular about this book and about the particular sections so for a lot more information a lot more in-depth kind of analysis be sure and check that out um and there is the end of my boring part although i can hear brian talking brian is not here quite yet it's very nice of him to say that Hopefully Brian's not completely over talking all the boring stuff, but Brian Wood is our usual co-host, who's here usually to make fun of my introduction. <laughs> and this week we're joined by Rachel Cardasco, who is the head of speculative fiction and translation. She also works at the Wisconsin Historical Society Press and has been a guest on the two-month review in the past, especially in relation to Rodrigo Frazan and the Invented Part, who she'll be interviewing. Look what at- I got in the mail. Oh, Licky, you got Licky, it. Licky, awesome. Licky. So yeah. next, in a couple weeks, on April 26th, Rachel will be interviewing Rodrigo Frazan in Chicago at Volumes Bookstore at 7 p.m. Tom Flynn, who you may know from previous podcast, is the one of the managers of Volumes and is the host of this particular event. Um, and Rachel will be doing the interview. They'll be reading from Bottom of the Sky. It'll be fantastic. So if you happen to be in the, Ro- or in the Rochester area, in the Chicago area, <laughs> be sure and come out. <laughs> Yay. So, welcome back, both Thank of you. you. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Brian, I think I, I think you I think you managed to liven up the boring stuff because we could hear most of what you're talking about as you're walking around. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which whatever. Like what? <laughs> uh, I couldn't make it out. We could just I could just hear your voice and your laugh. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Um, did you were you able to get your beverage? Yeah, yeah, I got, I'm good to go. I decided to drink. Uh, my brother was here, and he left uh, some some Grand Rapids beer, which as uh, founders as a, as a something which says that it's made out of the tears of the University of Michigan. <laughs> really? Oh wow! <laughs> oh, that's good. My one and only shot. <laughs> Is that really what it says? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it says something about uh. the god of architecture. Agriculture, so it's you know Haitian god of agriculture that fits in with with physics of sorrow. Absolutely, we'll figure it out. We'll make it work. <laughs> it totally does. So, Rachel, how have you been? Um, I've been good, but for the first three months of the year, we were all just like sick with four different viruses, and it just like went the rounds of the family. Just as the last person got better, the next person would get sick. And, so I'm, I feel like I'm still getting back to the land of the living. <laughs> That's the worst. Yeah, I'm so behind in just everything. I, I don't even know anymore what month it is or whatever. So, <laughs> how is the speculative fiction and translation? You have a both a blog and a podcast now, correct? Yes. Uh, I so the website is going to be uh, two in May, 
and um, and it uh, behaves better than my two-year-old uh, daughter, mm -hmm. but whatever. Um, <laughs> and uh, the podcast, I have uh, three, I've recorded three episodes so far. Um, and it's basically just information about um, the past month, uh, stuff and translation that's come out, interviews, um, other things. I'm not trying to be a podcaster. I'm just trying to kind of <laughs> find another outlet, like yeah. way to convey information for people who are too busy to look at the site, um, but who, you know, commute and want to listen. So, so far people have said it's, it's useful, so that's that's really what I want. Um, I heard I heard that there's a new TV show starring Zach Braff that's all about being a podcaster. Yes, I've, <laughs> I've heard about it. Uh, I we don't really watch like right like TV. Um, we just rent DVDs and and like right now we're watching Bond movies. So uh, <laughs> I don't know anything about TV now. I heard Roseanne's back. That's all I know. <laughs> Roseanne's back and Trump loves it. Okay. <laughs> I watched Moonraker the other day, and that is the most wonderfully bad Bond movie ever. They're in space with lasers. They're all because... horrible. They're no, this, horrible. Is, this one's so good. Oh. It's, it's fantastic. And like oh. Jaws is in space for some reason. <laughs> like, yes. This is so good. Okay, maybe that'll be better than, <laughs> than the first two. Oh. Garbage, whatever. Anyway. Which ones did you I, watch? Just the first two. So we watched. Uh, oh wait, wait. Which did we watch? What was the first one? Gold was Goldfinger. Doc, no, Doctor no. no. Yeah, yeah. And then we watched part of from Russia, from Russia, to Russia with, with love, love, something like which that. Which has gyps. Which all I know about gypsies is uh, <laughs> and and Turkey for that matter is, yeah. it, is from from Russia with love because it's set in mm -hmm. Istanbul, I think, right? Yeah. So yeah, I, but, I mean was, Sean Connery, young Sean Connery. I can look at him all day. So that's a, yeah. Be that's careful though. I agree, though. You know, to watch He'll, it. He will hit you with an open hand, so you need to look out. <laughs> <laughs> I think no. He said in an interview one time, like sometimes a woman needs a smack, or he said something like, <laughs> wow, like, wow. like that's a really like good. He said, I think he, yeah, I think he said it to Barbara Walters, and she kind of pressed him on it, and he basically said, "I'll smack you." And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so he's he's a hitter. He All right, he he's really a hitter. You know what? You hate on Roger Moore all you want, but he's not somebody that smacks ladies around. He was in a, a time. Is it a view for a kill? No, that's no. Timothy Dalton. Oh, no, no. Wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, that's the one that's, where, that takes place in Silicon Valley. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's the last yeah. one. The last James Bond movie I saw. That one's great, too. Yeah, it is, is it bad. That? Grace jo Grace Jones is in that. And uh, Christopher Walken is in that what? as well. Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll watch that. Bizarre. And I can't remember if that's the one that has Duran Duran that does the. Uh, oh God! They, oh no, they did the Living Daylights. Never mind. Okay, okay. You're a real Bond expert. Uh, I know enough, but not um, not a lot. Yeah, because like the real Bond geeks will like they really nerd out on James Bond. Yeah, anyone who gets into any particular thing knows more than everyone else. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, way deep. So. You want to talk about this book? Do, do you consider this, Rachel? Do you consider this a work of, of speculative fiction? Uh, I don't know. Is that a stretch? Uh, well, uh, oh wait, we're talking about. I'm sorry, my brain is in, is, is so is in the bottom of the sky. Sorry. Um, switching now to physics. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't. I wouldn't really say just because it's um, there's so much memoir, so much kind of. Mm -hmm first person like I don't know I mean the the style of it is is uh you know kind of the it reminds me a lot of of Frazan in um in the inventive part like move you know the the narrator moving in and out of different um people's minds and different times and I guess you could call that you know I I, I tend to to kind of stick with um Stuff that's kind of more obviously sci-fi, fantasy, horror, magical realism, yeah. meta. I don't know. I guess it's yeah, there's no like real, you know, agreement on what it is, but um, it's pretty. I mean, it's it's like right there on the border. I'd say 
It's like a little adjacent. Yeah, I think yeah. That, like the parts with the the going into people's memory is the thing that I was thinking of. But like, yeah. an element doesn't necessarily define a book as being part of a genre either. Right. It does in yeah. my book because it makes yeah. it. Really, it has to be a nice, neat packages. Otherwise, I can't make sense of anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, like, what, what was your question that I like, what makes literary fiction literary? Yeah, no, just for like when, when you're teaching students and stuff, like you have to have everything like black oh, and yeah. white with very thick borders. Yes. Like, <laughs> Otherwise they're like, well, wait a minute. Is this on the final? Am I? No, I, I they had sex. They had sex on? in the book. It's romance now. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Are Actually, you sure? Because yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's got sex. It's romance. Done. <laughs> and, and we went over a reader's report and class on Monday about an Estonian book in which the right the the get the student who wrote the reader's report was like, well, it's kind of like a spy novel set in like Estonia and Finland during uh the Cold War, but it's also a romance. And I don't like romance. It's like I don't what but what <laughs> like what kind of romance? It's like, well, the spy likes this, meets this other spy and they fall in love. It's like, well, I'm not certain that that's like no. <laughs> very tricky. <laughs> Doesn't seem like romance unless unless the cover has someone like ripping a bodice. I don't know. I'm gonna get hate mail for that, but we got and everything. Everything <laughs> is so subdefined though into those yeah. genres. Like well, you don't even uh, have romance anymore. Yeah. Well, my class was getting pissed just off of like just the distinction between genre and commercial fic or um, literary and commercial fiction. Yeah. Well, like, well, why why isn't mine literary? I'm like, well, because it's not good. Like, what do you mean, why? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> literary no, like, implies good automatically. No, like, it, like it almost, like, if you call something literary fiction, like, you know, like, oh, so what, you're like, you're some smarter than me, like, what, am I, am I good enough? Or, you know what I mean? Like, it's, you know, it's like, you're not allowed to be good, I guess. I don't know, like. I believe that's why they invented the term upmarket fiction, where it's like it's yeah, commercial yeah. fiction, but like it gives you a little bit of pretension because you're upmarket. You ain't, you ain't. <laughs> everybody's first. You can be like, oh, this is really literary, but it will also sell because it's upmarket. Like, yeah. I think my wife had the best description of it, right? She said, uh, I think literary is just people that really like to hear themselves right. <laughs> yeah. Or like, <laughs> like, they want to tell people that they're literary. Yeah. That works. That works perfectly. <laughs> Oh, a, song. Oh, and, yeah. a cat and a baby. I can't take it. Yeah. Come on, buddy. <laughs> You're cute. <laughs> so, anyway, so this section that we're talking about, just to be, make clear to everyone, is uh, chapter seven, Global Autumn, which goes from page 201 to 236. Um, this is literary fiction. This is literary fiction. <laughs> a few <laughs> elements of other things mixed in there, but you know, yeah. it's generally straight literary fiction. It's, a, it's like good. It's really good. And it's good. It, to read it, yep. Mm -hmm. It's funny that you mentioned um, uh, Frazan and Invented Park because we did. We, I don't think we talked about it live, but we talked about it separate. Uh, Brian and I did about how some parts of this are very reminiscent of, of yeah, uh, Invented yeah. Park and really like have fun. a similar sort of tone. And in this one, this is one of those ones, kind of for me. It doesn't. It doesn't. It's not quite doing any of the of Frazan's bits per se, but the idea that it's like obsessed with both memory and with space and space being sort of oppressive and depressing or melancholy and then also like his obsession with lists and answering all the things in lists yeah. and doing it in lists those two things are right there in, in a lot of Frazan's writing well too with Frazan we were um what was it tender as the night is the mm -hmm. uh kind of like the yeah. the text that explodes the narrative and this is the the minotaur story which kind of is the the through line with this one as well tender as the minotaur yeah tender as the <laughs> Tender is tender is the loin. Um, <laughs> no, that's that's romance. That's not literary. Sorry. <laughs> and then I, I like in this one too. It, it does have quite a bit of pop culture in it, but the pop yep. culture stuff is to kind of temper. It's it's set through the lens of if you're in a socialist coming out of late socialism with pop culture versus you know with Fr with Frizan, it's like this ex like bright explosion of pop culture, right? This kind of all has that gray autumn feel to it. Definitely autumn, global it's like the, autumn. It's a perfect. It's a perfect section to be talking about today. Um, oh God, it's snowing here in, in Wisconsin. See, yeah, I think it was snowing in New York yesterday. It's not <laughs> snowing here; it's just rainy and gross. But it feels like an autumn and not like spring, like that sort of oppressive, melancholic moment. Well, he um, also reminds me um, the way, especially with the um, 
the question of uh, how are you? When yeah. asks you <laughs> how are you? Um, you know, it's the same like diving in and kind of like not wallow, like just just kind of lingering, kind uh, kind of within the like mundane things of life. You know, just not not like you know making a plot point and moving on. You know, it's, both of them seem to to like to dive in and then and kind of riff, but yeah, you know, riff very. You know, like like I wish my brain did that. You know, I, I never think in, in, yeah. and I know that this is not a reflection of their of their thought pattern, but it, it makes you think that this is how they're thinking. And yeah. it's very uh close and it's very patient, which I think is one of Frazon's things about like we're all so, you know, uh, our attention spans suck and we're so distracted by our phones that we don't have time to just sink into something like a thought. You know, yeah. Um, so that that was really reminding me of the invented part too. That's it's interesting because. Oh, go ahead. No, you go on. Okay, I, mine mine's probably better than yours. Oh, I'm so sure. It's probably, it's right. probably best that I go. I think that way I can just and forget this. mine along the way, and it's better. <laughs> that's, that's the hope. No, because it's almost like in a fast-paced life that we have. You, you would treat this as like semantics or something like, Oh, you know, whereas to me, it's almost like a, a very thoughtful interrogation of kind of breaking something down into smaller parts and looking at each part. It's, it's frank. It's kind of fun to take it all apart and then put it back together or something so simple that you would never, it's like, it's like straight laced tennis shoes. And you're like, Oh, if you look on the other side of your straight laced tennis, shoes, it's really complex to make it look so simple and neat. So something like, how are you is so loaded and there's so many entanglements within that. And it's fun to look at that. Yeah. And th that's the part that particular, like kind of reflection is the part that reminded me the most of Dubrovka Ugrashik actually. And she has various essays. We've done a few of our essay collections, like karaoke culture. And I think it's in there or in Europe and sepia where she sort of addresses the same idea of like, in, in if you, you'll know if someone's from Eastern Europe, if you greet them and you're like, how are you doing? And they're like, uh, I don't know. Like, <laughs> it's complicated. Like, it's never just <laughs> like, Americans are like, oh, I'm fine. Whatever. Who gives a shit? But it used to be are like, ah, you know, it's better than it was yesterday, I suppose. But probably not as good as tomorrow. tomorrow, well, I, cir tomorrow. I, I circled this one. Let this be as bad as it gets. Exclamation <laughs> point. Because yeah. I'm like, that is true. That's like a very strange. like a very Jewish response. Okay, like, yeah, I was about to say. You know, you find someone, you're like, "How's it going, man? May this be the worst." <laughs> <laughs> like my mom used to say that. Oh my god! Very, very like because with you know, so again, it's, it's very dramatic and very like self-deprecating and very much like life obviously sucks. But what are we going to do? Yeah, you know, what are we going to do about it? Still There's breathing, but that might yeah. change. <laughs> <laughs> Losing look, mom, brain look, cells. Mom, I'm, like, this is why I don't call you mom, because you say things like this to me. I could die. I don't know. <laughs> Never know when it's going to be my time. <laughs> yep. <laughs> exactly. That's one of my favorite parts in here. And it's like, it is such a, it is, does seem to have like a bit of the Jewish humor, but it's also yeah. so... It's so particular that Eastern European mm. kind of self-deprecating vibe to me. Like so many of these books that we do that are from Eastern Europe, that's the sense of humor. Like it's not yeah. like that kind of over the top jokey sort of flashy, uh, more traditional American thing. Uh, and it's not really like a British sense of humor where it's the kind of snarky, ironic bit, but it's more of this just sort of, well, you know, you are starting from a baseline of like, things are crappy. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to be crappy. It's a very like, uh, logical just kind of like straight up view of life i mean you're not going to find that many people being disappointed you know because they're already disappointed with life yeah so you, just, you know there's nowhere to go but up i guess well just a couple pages later it says you know 1968 <laughs> uh never happened here oh yeah yeah <laughs> right so, mm -hmm. so like just, love and free freedom of expression and all like yeah that shit never happened here. everybody like, was also like assassinated <laughs> then too so well true but you know it wasn't all it was it all flower. Right? yeah flower power and yeah <laughs> like yeah, yeah we never got that we went straight to yugos and concrete walls <laughs> <laughs> oh god that is so true and so so sad. Mm -hmm. that, 
there, that that also like uh, kind of ties into the idea of this uh, empty space in the saddest place in the world, which I love. <laughs> this has <laughs> one of my favorite parts of everything. Yeah. Um, of the where he says the saddest place in the world is the Economist called it in 2010. I clipped out the article as if there is truly a geography of happiness. And then this part's the part that I love. I wrote about this for, the, for a newspaper, an innocent piece, which stirred up a backlash on the internet, and I received threats. The first I had, I had since, or the first since I had started publishing, no one has to be told that he doesn't exist. I didn't take the hint. I wrote a few more pieces, more ironic than anything else, about the fact that 1968 never happened here, about how we don't exist, how we're not so non-existent that we have to do something really over the top to be noticed. And that is like, I love like that. Kill, like killing the Pope. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I love, real all, <laughs> I love all parts of that because it's like not only this, the idea of the saddest place on earth and it being like this particular region is being mm -hmm. deemed such a thing, but then to like write something about it. And of course, if you write something about that or like, hey, guess what? We were called the saddest place on earth. People are just going to be like, fuck you. You're the worst. <laughs> You're the saddest. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> well, no matter what you, you do. Did you get any backlash for your... Your, the piece that you wrote on translating, like, uh, <laughs> interrogating if, if this is a good word choice or not. Oh, yeah. 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 Quite really a bit. Because whether you're right I or wrong. I can only imagine. <laughs> but whether you're right or you're wrong, if you're, I think we talked about this like a week ago or something that, you know, it's dangerous to actually think in public right now. Like you need to not, <laughs> not to try to formulate or think or do anything mm -hmm. on record because you're going to get just crucified for it. You have to be so careful. Yeah, it's and, and like yeah, shh. but it's the same thing here. <laughs> We're talking about you know an innocent piece in which you know got all this backlash and death threats just off of thinking in public, like you, through the newspaper. Like you can't. Yep, <laughs> it really is. It's 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 not surprising because I think that's how the internet wants things to be, um, is to have like instant reactions and like some something built in. So there's something baked into the way the internet functions that altered our discourse so fundamentally that it's better to not think and just to retweet something or say something just innocuous because then you're more likely to be liked than to actually try and like, not even like say something meaningful, but really just like not be sure. Sure, five translations that you might like. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. You know, I thought, I thought more people are gonna be pissed about the one that went up today about the specter. But so far, that's that because it was like so self-critical. I think that it was people have been like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> like you can you can do that. That's that's funny, and you didn't say anything. Uh, there's no real opinion because both sides are are it sort of attacks itself. I liked I liked the uh, the back and forth in your in your brain. That was fun. I this is uh, that is how I live, um, and is not. I don't know that that's healthy. Like. <laughs> I'm not I certain mean, that was, this isn't was, a cry for help. I love reading it, so <laughs> I'm just, I'm, you know, this is from my point of view, you know. Man. <laughs> anyway, with that, like the the other part of this idea in this particular section, like that's, that, well, I was going to say too, the saddest place on earth, I don't know that it's where they're describing there. I think the saddest place on earth might be the Amazon fulfillment center that they're putting into Henrietta, just, <laughs> just south of here. That's gonna end up being the saddest place on earth. I think it's great. Rochester's finally getting a big bookstore. You know, there's gonna be so many books in there. <laughs> well, it's how you define bookstore. <laughs> I hope so. building, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's clear clearly a joke, but <laughs> you know if you Google in, in like a month, if you Google bookstore Rochester, you're gonna get Amazon fulfillment center. <laughs> Just like, then, people will be like, huh. Oh, oh, cool. Hey, they must have everything. Um <laughs> For this was announced today, which is why we're sort of joking about it. But there's the idea of like all these spaces too. And like the idea in here of like travel, which does come up in Frazan too and in a lot of other people's work. But like that there most recently I read uh, Olga Tokarczyk's Flights, which has similar sort of bit of like always being in motion and this going from place to place and that that's not very fulfilling um, in a lot of ways. I mean, he does have like the physical manifestation of that when he breaks down in Finland and has to be hospitalized. But there's also just like that, there's a line towards the end here where it's like, you know, we, I got done with this year of travel and all I had were a bunch of notebooks. Yeah, like 233. And that's my journeys naturally came to an end. I returned to the saddest place in the world, shattered. All that remained from several years of hotels, airports, and train stations were a couple of notebooks filled with hastily jotted impressions. Um, 
like the smells of places. I like the the smells or the signs, like impressionism toilets. They're that way, or you yeah. know, <laughs> yeah. there's, there were some really neat uh, concrete okay. details that were you could tell must have been. He actually must have seen this and, and taken it from his notebook because it seemed too too on point and perfect to be invented. It's true, very true. And like the, the even like the going with the traveling, just the hotels too. Yeah, mm. he on two two twenty two. He was saying. Um, in the memory of hotel section, he says, I'm developing a peculiar kind of memory for those memoryless places, hotels, the ideal hotel room. He sets out the ideal hotel room shouldn't, you know, recall anyone's presence. It should just be totally clean and spotless and no one should ever know that anyone was ever there. And then he goes on to, you know, describe each hotel room <laughs> and what made it, you know, very specific, like the one in Helsinki, the one in Pisa, uh, you know, the one in, in Paris and in Prague and um, as if he's, again, it seems a very um, similar thing that Frazan is doing where you're catching a memory and like almost, you know, like pinning it, you know, trying to say, nope, there was something specific about this one. We are not moving through a, you know, uh, a succession of empty meaningless hotel rooms where our existence is, you know, worthless, you know, I left an impression, someone else, else left an impression, you know, we're alive. <laughs> we, we have, there's some sort of meaning here. Um, which, yeah, which is, I mean, I don't, I don't really think about that when I go into a hotel, I'd really like it to be like, I don't want to think of who was there before me. <laughs> I don't want people to think of me like, you know, who was here before me, you know, I don't want that, but he yeah. likes to, make that very real that's true you know yeah and it does have that that's kind of concrete the physical presence with his, his consciousness inhabiting it and then on certain ones of these he ties them into authors too so you have mm -hmm. Bavard and Pekache, mm -hmm. you have Pessoa like it, there's that that also that yeah. that phrase on a, idea that like your mind also as you process things you're also including these pop culture or these literary references or I mean I guess Bovard and Pekache is upmarket fiction I don't know so. <laughs> and to our, our friends in Berlin, it's the best place to die. <laughs> who, wants, who wants to live in Berlin? I'm here to die. <laughs> it's like, ouch. It's funny, the, reading this this time was so crazy because this is, uh, and this isn't really that that notable, I guess, but when I got to the part on 214 where it says, in February 1918, the Bulgarian poet Gio Milov came here to patch up a shattered head and stayed a whole year. No idea who that was reading it before. Um, but we published the book, uh, The Same Night Awaits Us All, which is another great Eastern European idea of death and, uh, <laughs> and eventual sadness. And it's all about Gio Milov. So it has his whole story yeah. as like this great poet and how he got involved with this anarchist and started this magazine and like was assassinated by the government. Um, and so now reading that, it's like, whoa, yeah, I get this now. But I no idea the first time, probably just like, whatever, Bulgarian poet, you know, poets. So many layers. Yeah, I just, you don't you, know what you don't know. But then when you find out, it, it's like, ah, that's a whole other level to that, to that yep. section. That, like, I know I missed a bunch of stuff in the invented part. Oh, God, I yeah. Could have yeah. Gotten, and, and I was like, I know there's more here. Just don't know what it is. Yeah. So if, the, if the United States was going to assassinate a writer, or like a, a fiction writer or a poet, <laughs> who would they? Who, who would they assassinate? I wonder. <laughs> like that, the government would want not want to exist. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I guess we could take the current regime, but I mean, I imagine there's ones that like multiple regimes would want to have assassinated. I'm trying to think who who it would be. A writer, though. Yeah. Do they care enough? Probably I, not. They're like assassinating other time. people. Like it's. They're too busy. I know, like, you know, if we're going to kill ideas. Yeah, but at some point in time, they truly did because there's that whole, all that, that long history of the CIA hiring um, like George Plimpton and various other people to work for them to report on uh, intellectuals and what they're yeah. thinking and doing. And they, going back to the 68, like that period in time, they definitely wanted to know what like Abby Hoffman or I'm not really a writer, but like um, that whole group of people whose names I'm blanking out on, but what they were up to. Eldridge Cleaver. Elders Cleaver, yeah, even like the, like Allen Ginsberg, all those kind of like they were sowing seeds of dissent, and I think that that that's a, that's maybe the difference is that you is how could you really be a writer that sows seeds of dissent now that are like palpable enough to make anyone that worried about the overall structure of power? I don't know. 
I can't. Well, I know I know it's Poetry Month, but nobody cares about poetry, so that's not gonna. <laughs> I've been I've been reading poetry all month, man. I found yeah? I actually yeah I'm trying my best and uh, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real struggle. So, it's a, is that the poetry? I, is that because I feel like I'm always shitting on poetry and don't you publish? Isn't ten percent of your publishing uh, catalog a poetry? Less, a little less than ten percent, but yeah, okay. yeah, fair enough. Please, Louise, um, dude. And I like, I like it. I respect it, but I don't ever feel like I know how to talk about it or how to appreciate it. But the bigger problem, which I know is absolutely the case, and that's much more. Um, uh, uh, issue with me is that I don't slow down enough to read it. Like I don't, I don't like reading poetry because it's not something that I can consume very fast. Okay. And so I like to read through the books of poetry, and that's dumb. Like you don't get anything that way, really. I it's think not you, like, you haven't read. I think, yeah, you just need to find. Like I haven't found any anything that grabbed me that's been written. Like the most recent was like, oh, uh, Billy Collins. I mean. That's a long. That's that's a long time ago now. But like, you know, I go back to you know Elizabeth Bishop and Henry Reed and um, and Eliot, you know, and it it's because that it really it really is reading like music, and that's really what got me in. Whereas like a lot of poetry that that I've read that's been published recently, you know, people don't. It doesn't seem like a lot of people are really trying to use any sort of self-constraints, you know, like, like rhyming or some sort of meter or some sort of other thing. It's just like, they're just writing their thoughts and, and that makes me frustrated. So yeah. maybe you just need to find the right, the right one that, that stops you, you know, from, from going past. But I just, I didn't bring it up because I thought it was interesting that like in these countries, these, like th there's like poetry heroes, right? Like heroes yeah. of the state are, po are, are writers or poets or they'll get assassinated because their ideas are so powerful or strong. And I don't think we have that here necessarily. Like I, I remember reading, um, the first time I encountered this was when I read Bolaño's Distant Star. And it's talking mm -hmm. about the, the, the hero poet that would skywrite or whatever on an airplane. I, I think I have right. that right. I don't know. But it was like, well, one, why do people like a poem, a poetry person can't be a hero. And two, <laughs> but like, yeah, it's just, a, it's a weird thing that seems, it seems very, uh, like un, you know, United States, like un-American to use the term, like of something being so important, you're gonna get killed over it. Like here we're just like, yeah, whatever, do your thing. We'll do a poetry month and yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was somehow codify it and make it like, not yeah. dangerous or you know, just neuter it in some way. Well, no, I mean, I, I like the idea of it being dangerous or something that scares yeah. the state or offends people. Or like, I think that's, if, if it's meaningful, I think, I think that's a wonderful thing that we're, yeah. we're kind of missing here. Well, I think it's back to what you said about how people are so scared to say anything. Um, yeah, yeah. That they're, that it's like, well, I'm going to offend this group of people, but you know, what you're talking about reminds me of when I, um, I read something about, um, the Irish, uh, I think he just was a dramatist, uh, Jam Singh. Sorry. Jam Singh. Yeah, like, yeah. And, and whatever, one of his plays, um, people went to see it and they rioted afterwards. And I was Amazing. like, man, <laughs> man, when do you go and see something? And you're like, you feel that strongly about it that you riot. Dude, I love that play. story. <laughs> I, I love, love it. it. I love that story because it's, yeah, the, the play is the playboy of the Western world. That's it, like, that's it, right. Yeah, and it's all about like a guy who says that he's killed his father and everyone's like, oh, you're awesome. But then they find out that he didn't kill his father and they're like, oh, fuck you, you're just a fraud. You're just a lying <laughs> Irish sack of shit. And, like, and everyone was like, you're making fun of the Irish. Yeah. <laughs> like, not really, like, being good. They so they ran and went crazy. They did it yeah. for Sean O'Casey's place too. But it reminds me, it wasn't that far removed in time. But George Antiel, I think that's how you say his name, the composer, um, uh, classical composer, was in France. And he did a performance in which he hid, like, airplane engines on stage. And in the middle of this performance, there's, like, alarms go off. And there's <laughs> airplane engines. And people lost their goddamn minds. And, like, there's a riot for that, too. And that was a period of time, the 20s and 30s, where people would, mm -hmm. yeah, they would absolutely riot and, like, yeah. get all offended or, like, just be like, hell no. Art's meaningful. You can't do it this way. Yeah. Now it's like, eh, it sucked. Let's go, you know, eat dinner or something. 
Is that poetry yeah, on Twitter something. or Instagram? Instagram poetry yeah. is the big thing now. That's what everyone oh, like that poetry book sold sold like three hundred thousand copies. What? There's like an Instagram poet and her book sells a billions of copies or three hundred thousand. Don't tell me these things. Hooray. <laughs> no. I'm gonna tie this together with poetry though for one more second. So we know <laughs> Gospodinov is a poet, and um this all does fit together. Um today I got a package in the mail from Angela Rodell. Uh, the translator whose music um, from Splendor and Misery, uh, uh, what's the name of the song again? Oh, Stars and Babies, um, opens and closes the podcast. Well, she sent me her her CDs. They finally arrived. And this book, which is um, From One Sky to Another Two, translations from Bulgarian into English. And it has a whole poetry section. And I was hoping that it had one of Gospodinov's poems in here, but it doesn't. So, or else I would read that. But it does happen to have the very first one I opened up to is um, a poem that's translated by a Bulgarian translator who's coming here to Rochester in a week <laughs> to do like a three week residency. So oh, all cool. coincidences, all things Bulgarian, all ties together I and loved, poetry. I loved Angela's oh. interview. I just, I thought that was great. She seemed, I, I like could listen to her talk about translation. I knew nothing about Bulgarian literature, but it was just fascinating. It was real. I, I was like, wow, I have to go after her. <laughs> I mean, it was my fault because I wanted, you know, I said, oh, I'm not going to be alive until like April. So like, how are you? We'd like to be on this. Well, I don't know that I'll be breathing come April. First, so <laughs> I, I, wasn't sure. like... I wasn't sure. I wanted to be honest with you, you know, <laughs> but I really wanted to do it. So I was like, well, the last one, one of the last ones would be great. Then, yeah. I, I think you're doing great. Yeah, Thank I think so you. too. <laughs> I am breathing, so that's good. I I like this section too because it does sort of hint back towards the without being so explicit, hints back towards that Minotaur as being the melancholy uh place because it does have that reference. I guess it comes through the reference to the labyrinth, that there's the bit about the labyrinth is frustrating because it's not because it's uh there's your, where is it? The labyrinth is someone's fossilized hesitation. The most oppressive thing about the labyrinth is that you're constantly being forced to choose. It isn't the lack of an exit, but the abundance of exits that is so disorienting. Of course, the city is the most obvious labyrinth. Barthes points to Paris as a model. The labyrinths of the center and the outskirts built by Hausmann. And then talks about being lost in the city and all these sort of exits and the choices and the options of that. And that sort of in some way kind of... Uh, for me anyways, led back towards the Minotaur and like the idea that the Minotaur is in this labyrinth or that people are people going into the labyrinth are, aren't going to end well either, but he's in there with all these choices, all the space, no way out. Um, and it's constantly stuck there. And in a way the narrator becomes the Minotaur in this section of being in the world of which there's all these places you can go. And every place is a, is a dead end of a hotel room or like an airport um, and isn't going to be satisfying. And you're just there as a sort of like sourful melancholy minotaur this is a pretty drag of a section <laughs> well it, and now and i just while you were talking i was just looking back at 219 again directional signs in the museum of fine arts yeah and they're all pointing the same way too yep. so you're like you got your romanticisme romanticisme impressionisme and all that other stuff and it's all in the toilets it's all over there and you know and so it kind of is i mean it's like well if they're all over there where are they you know i mean yeah. once you get there you know which now which way do you turn it's like when we went to the louvre um we we got so lost i mean i thought we were gonna die there <laughs> we, got, we got so damn lost and we kept going up to the people and like i was using french i know i was speaking french and they just they knew i wasn't french so they were just like really and I kept saying, "Where's I want to go to the street, the street. And they kept saying, you know, next exhibit. And I was like, no, the street. I swear, I don't know how we got out. Oh, you want a Banksy? <laughs> no, I don't. I want to see Banksy. <laughs> you want no, the street, you I want street to, art? <laughs> I want to go. No, I want to, to leave. I want to get out of here. I want to get the hell out of here. <laughs> Let me go out. Let me get out. I don't know. I think we had to go down to like the bowels of the, like the, like the Egyptian art. And somehow my husband found like the way out and we like stumbled out like, Oh my God, that was close. 
You know, that's just what that reminded me of. And so I guess his, so this book is really, it's very, it's, it's making me remember uh, my experiences with signs as such a labyrinth in the loop. And they do it on purpose. They don't want you to leave. No, you just yeah. keep them. They keep don't. It. Just keep you rolling, roaming around forever. <laughs> I think that's the goal. But. It, there's always every year, every fall, there's one of those stories that comes out of like some family that went to a corn maze in the middle of like <laughs> fucking Ohio, <laughs> and they just, they all goes down and like and like they're found by a dog three days later. I won't go in those things. <laughs> I just <laughs> that's traps. I don't. Maybe not being from the Midwest, the Midwest people are more used to it. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not doing it. I will never find my way out. Are you kidding? Who was the first person? You know. Hey, you know what we ought to do is just uh, <laughs> make a big ass maze in the corn. You know, we're, ain't nobody gonna eat corn. We might as well make a maze. <laughs> You're getting a lot of praise on the chat for your accents, Brian. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I've been working on them. Yeah. Comedy, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like you want to be semantic. First, you have to build an observation tower in the middle of your flat ass field so you can <laughs> yeah. see where folks are. You have to plow the, like, draw it up. So it's probably like on some, you know, like, you know, giant Denny's menu, drawing up your corn maze or whatever. It's something and, to do. Yeah. It's what the hell? Do. You could have adopted like 80 kids <laughs> and, you know, fed people, but no, you're going to make a dumb maze in the middle of your field. Wasting gas and food and building a tower and just so people can get go die and have a dog find them three days later. Yeah. <laughs> yep. uh, America, this is why we're not this is why we're not assassinating poets in the United States. <laughs> Saddest place in the world. Yeah. <laughs> There's a For corn maze in Henrietta too. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> it's right right next to the Mormon tablets or whatever. We got everything out here. <laughs> true it's very true oh man there was a lot i had, i identified with in this because you know like i i did yeah. the whole go through europe thing and like i i could definitely identify with that uh when he talks about seeing a fight in person close up for the first time that's, like my, I ever... that's my line okay yeah tell me do you have a, a fight that, close up story no but that's my favorite my favorite line is that one from this oh, section okay. So okay. I'll just give it now because and let you go on. But my favorite one is I now realize that my only experience with fights is from movies and literature. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Which I feel. Yeah, because. Go ahead. Oh, that, I feel it's absolutely true for me. It's like it's like it's like that moment in um some movie Slackers where the guys like. The, yeah. There's the one character that's stuck in the house with all the TV screens, and he's like, "I went outside once, and like I saw this guy get stabbed, and like the blood was all the wrong color, like the tip was just <laughs> way off, is yeah. not real." <laughs> my, yeah, my... I was, I was like, "Why would you even try?" I, you know, I, I really wanted, I, I felt like he was talking to me. I don't know. It just seems so, so much of a conversation. You know, where I was just like, why would you, why would you even get involved? I mean, what draw, you know, I would have run so fast, but then again, you know, it depends on, you know, uh, like your experiences, you know, I think maybe most women would not have gotten involved. You know, maybe if you're a guy, you know, if you are really strong, it would be different than if you weren't. I mean, it, you know, it's kind of like, well, you know, why would you get involved in that whole other, you know, that whole other thing going on that you know you would, I mean, he wound up getting hurt and having to pay for the window. It's like, <laughs> you knew that was going to happen, right? <laughs> I don't know. I actually I, did. You yeah, just it, reminded me. I'd forgotten this, but in relation to that, I did see a real fight one time in New York City on the way back from a reading that we had for uh, Braggy Olofsson, the Icelandic author. Um, and I was carrying my backpack with like a ton of books in it. And I saw all these people gathered around and there was a guy punching the shit out of another guy on the, on the ground, just punching him and <sighs> punching him. And the guy on the ground took off his belt like he was going to try and whip the guy punching him. And the guy punching him just grabbed the belt, put it around his neck, cinched it, and started dragging him. And it was a moment of like <laughs> looking at other people. And these other people are like, someone was on the phone calling the cops. But there's this moment of like, someone needs to 
physically do something or this person is going to die. And I'm like seven feet away maximum. And I've got this bag that weighs easily 30 pounds. And I thought if I swung and I just brain this guy, like all, I would be a hero. And then immediately my second thought was, there's absolutely no fucking way that I would do this right. <laughs> like I would fall. And then his friends would come after you. And I would no. be dead. And no. this is a bad idea. I'm staying out of it. And you don't even know what the background of it was. Like, no, maybe he deserved okay. it. Really. I mean, not that it's okay to do that to someone, but you know, no. <laughs> he might have like kicked the guy's dog or something. I mean, who knows? You well, know, I remember I, there was a yeah. there was a fight that was happening at a house party when we were in high school, and you know, everybody gathers around to watch the fight and. Before the fight even got started, somebody came up from behind the other person and they hit him in the head with an empty 40 ounce bottle. And then I, I just clearly remember it made this noise that just went pink, like a golf ball getting hit by a golf, like a driver. Oh, and the, but, the bottle didn't, but the bottle didn't break. <laughs> it, it, just, they like, it was a full swing to someone's head and it just goes... <laughs> Dink. <laughs> we're just like, oh, like everybody like recoil. Like that's not how this happened. Like in the movies, it shatters <laughs> and the person falls down, and they were just like, oh, oh, my head. Like, and then that was the fun. It was just, <laughs> bing, and done. Like, okay, that's nothing like the movies. Yeah, it's just so boring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're just like, oh, wow, not good. I actually think though, like I we say that that line of like I, I only know fights from the movies and literature, but I feel like I also, mostly know them from movies. Like I can't think of a really well just defined fight scene from a book. I might just be blanking out though. You're not reading enough commercial fiction. You're only reading literary. God, you're right. That's exactly. Literary people are too refined. You know, they just stab yeah. each other with words. <laughs> if you read, if you read Street Fighter Two fan fiction, I mean, there's some killer fights when Guile goes up against Ryu or something like. Oh man, jab, jab, well, jab, fierce. I mean, finish a fight between like a bear and and an old and old ladies. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 seriously. One of the best books I've ever read in my whole life, and I don't, I just, I don't know why, but like, uh, it's called Den Dendera. Um, it's a Japanese book, and of course, it's well, yeah. I mean, it's it's a guy. It's it's about uh old women. There's like a ritual in a village where old women are left who are about to die, are left on a mountain, and they're supposed to just kind of like <laughs> die. And I don't know. It, it's a way to like, it's a way to like keep the the people from like sucking in all the resources of the village or whatever. And, um, but instead these, some of these women have decided that they don't want to die. And so they've started this village on a, on a mountaintop and half of the problem is, you know, they have to stay alive somehow. And there's a hungry mama bear and her kid. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it is the most gory, like detailed and just disgusting. Like the bear, just like entrails, like ripping out. And I don't know, this is not my thing usually, but the book is so amazing. But yeah, that's what I think of it. I think of a fight, a bear and an old lady. So, like, I read the book Battle Royale, which I believe was Japanese right. as well. And it's like seventh grade kids obliterating each other. Yeah, with, they're like, hardcore with the Japanese. No, no, they're not though, because they 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 blur out pornography penetration. So like you can't do that, but like old ladies can get disemboweled by bears, yeah. and seventh <laughs> graders yeah. can kill each other with pipe wrenches. But oh, good God, let's not look at two people have sex. That would be uncouth. That is a that is an interesting culture. I'll tell you that. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah it would take a lot to get used to. Yes, it's just, it's so different. It's we went way off the rails. We're talking about bears killing <laughs> ladies. There's a fight. There's a fight. <laughs> there's a fight. We yeah. got the fights here. There's a, there's a literary fight. Mm -hmm. That's how, that's how a book should work, man. Sparks all mm -hmm. kinds of other ideas. Yeah. <laughs> the other part that I the the part that I uh, that that I identified with um, wasn't so much the word choice, but the bit of like running into someone and they're like, Oh, Hey man, how are you doing? And being like, I have no idea who this is. And like, <laughs> and like <laughs> so much, I feel like that happens to me when I wake up at home some days, but I'm just like, Oh, wait a second. I need to justify who you are. <laughs> and like, <laughs> <laughs> Justify. 
justify, oh, you're my kid. Justify um, your existence. <laughs> that just that's the wrong words. But the the but that part with that, I was gonna. I meant to greet you, Brian. When you came back as senior schlong, but I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> It's such a that's that's I don't know what that would have been in the original Bulgarian, but I love that senior oh, schlong. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't been called that since I was a Boy Scout leader. <laughs> We've mutually, it, it was mutual. I'm, uh, whatever. No. <laughs> but he, I like how he's saying like we're trying. So I'm trying so hard, like asking all the usual questions while in my head going, "Who are you? Who the hell are you?" <laughs> yeah, this double like layer of, and it reminded me of a song. There's a Billy Billy Joel song where there's like a whole <laughs> section. <laughs> Story song. <laughs> it's a whole section where it's like, I'm great. The kids are great. How are you? Haven't seen you in forever. And it was like the exact same conversation <laughs> that was in here. And I remember thinking, this is the weirdest thing to put in a song. Um, but it might have been ironic. And and this is, yeah, it's the same thing. It's like, maybe you'll give away a clue if I just keep asking you questions. I and guarantee maybe, you, Billy Joel was never meant to be ironic <laughs> i really want to, i want to believe that he was in this no case. that's fine i agree i think it'd be, but hell no <laughs> you know, i really hope I, it was it was just it was the exact same conversation how are you kids the, the job the whatever and I, yeah who is this guy <laughs> i must think about that uh kroll show skit of uh the the bit the the, <laughs> the the tales of young billy joel like every every other week <laughs> my guys are gonna go off and write my story songs. <laughs> I like Billy Joel. So. <laughs> it's kind of like it is interesting though, you know, bringing up Billy Joel in this. That uh, there, there's a lot of room for pleasantries in the United States. That like, you know, depending on if if you actually had problem, like real hard problems, those pleasantries are gone, right? Like, how are you? Is like kind of offensive in a way, like. <laughs> Really? You're going to come ask me, like, you know how I am. Like, we both live in the same shithole together. Like, what do you mean, how am I? <laughs> we live in the saddest place on earth. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, around here, we're, we're not, like, you know, we're not being killed by, you know, drone strikes from the sky, and we're not having public beheadings. We, crazy weather we're having today, isn't it? <laughs> you know, like, we have There's a lot of garbage place at Wegmans. I don't even know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, my Wi-Fi has been so spotty. What Wi-Fi do you have? You know, like <laughs> those are I know like, it's so it's like yeah, it's like oh my god, what happened to my internet? Yeah. Wait a minute, wait, yeah. is the world ending? Because I mean, it could end. It could be ending. That could be a reason. I can't even <laughs> update my phone for three more months. Like I'm not even sure. <laughs> I'm just kidding about that. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Are there any other last things that you guys wanted to talk about or bring up, or do you have a favorite line? My favorite, my favorite line was, well, it's not a line, but it's, um, it's the whole sequence on 206 where, oh no, no. Okay. Oh man. I have so many. Okay. never mind. <laughs> How goes, ugh, I'm going to do two. I'm just going to do two. Okay. Uh, the top, uh, of 206 is my first you one. Sound just like, you sound just like my wife when we're ordering food. Like, what are you going to order? <laughs> it doesn't do matter this. what I'm going to order. Just, just get your food. <laughs> Just pick what you want. It's the Just white pick it. Voice. <laughs> okay. Um, I need I needed a new shield of Achilles against bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah that's perfect. Good pick. And then and then below that, uh, how are you? How are you? How are you? How are you supposed <laughs> to answer that? Yeah. Yep. You can just hear it. Like, how am I supposed to answer that stupid question? <laughs> it's a great page. It's my favorite page. It really is. Right next to that, the one of the the responses that I underlined that I then started was, "We're fine, but it'll pass." <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> I feel like that's my usual Tuesday. Any that got the, will be the highly acclaimed "ha." Huh. That's a very good. <laughs> that's, that's very high regards in my note taking. I have "hehe" if he you can see that. Oh, there you go. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome, Brian. Do you have a line? Uh, I liked on the. Uh, 
the first paragraph on 223. Uh, the whole evening, I listened to the bed and the room above me creaking and precise, robust I am. A thought crossed my mind and I wrote it down. The cheaper the hotel, the more furious the fucking. <laughs> I like that too. <laughs> It was only because this was, again, another thing that, like, you're hungry? Okay, one moment. Sorry, Daddy said a naughty word. Um, I was staying in a hotel in, in San Diego. Cook you some food? Okay, one moment. It's kind of late for food. Go ahead and cook you some food. Okay, you just have to wait. One sec. I was uh, staying in, like, a super cheap... Yes. Yes, I will. One moment. We're you almost go done. Ahead. You go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> well, apparently I have to go cook food. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> You've been told. This is about but the type of child eating joke. Oh, I know. I, I stayed Daddy, in the, the ahead, cheapest go. hotel I could find in all of San Diego. And the people next to me were just going at it all night long. And it was so stinking loud, like <laughs> ridiculously loud. Where like I was just like all right cool like it's the walls it what are it thin. Is. It's what, yeah. it's what the walls are thin. And so and, I like I'm like know. creating in my mind who these people are and like they have to be athletic because like holy cow the stamina incredible. <laughs> and then I'm leaving and, Daddy, and they're coming out. You cook me some food. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you think you're. So, okay, shh, one second. So after this all night long marathon session they've been doing, they come out and it's like the most overweight, like they have to have like the red car. Like, how do they do this? This is incredible. Like it was, ex expe my expectation what was reality was completely subverted and I'll never forget it. But yeah, cheap hotel and yeah, it's furious. <laughs> Fast and furious. Oh man. Okay. Um, I guess we can round it there. Uh, one last reminder that next week we'll be back on Mondays. We'll be talking about the next part of the book, which is elementary physics of sorrow. And as always, be sure and check out uh, Santiago's um, post that he's putting up every week on the 3% website. He's getting way into depth into the book, even more so than we are. And and I, with less, less uh, fewer, fewer like off it's topic jokes. Too <laughs> as opposed, oh, like, the who, Sorry. Which, which is a great it's a great it's a great compliment to what we're doing here. And I everyone should go check those out, read all of those. We'll put them all into one place um once they're all finished. But until then, I have nothing else to add. Except that Isaac's hungry, Brian. I gotta go, go and make her some food. I gotta go so in the kitchen and cute. Thing. I gotta go cook I cook some it. food right now. Daddy, yes. it's my turn to talk to Chad. Oh, okay. You want to talk to Chad? We'll do it after we're done with the podcast. We have to uh, <laughs> sign off real quick, okay? That's perfect. Take care, guys. Pessoa, like it, there's that that also that yeah. that phrase on uh, idea that like your mind also as you process things you're also including these pop culture or these literary references.
or I mean, I guess Bovard and Pekka is upmarket fiction. I don't know. So. <laughs> and to our, our friends in Berlin, it's the best place to die. <laughs> who, wants, who wants to live in Berlin? I'm here to die. <laughs> it's like, ouch. It's funny. The, reading this this time was so crazy because this is, uh, and this isn't really that that notable, I guess, but when I got to the part on 214 where it says, in February 1918, the Bulgarian poet Gio Milov came here to patch up a shattered head and stayed a whole year. No idea who that was reading it before, um, but we published the book uh, The Same Night Awaits Us All, which is another great Eastern European idea of death and, uh, <laughs> and eventual sadness, and it's all about Gio Milov, so it has his whole story. Yeah as like this great poet and how he got involved with this anarchist and started this magazine and like was assassinated by the government. Um, and so now reading that, it's like, whoa, yeah, I get this now. But I had no idea the first time, probably just like whatever, Bulgarian poet, you know, poets. So many layers, yeah, I just, you don't mm -hmm. know what you don't know, but then when you find out it, it's like, ah, that's a whole other level to that, to that yep. section that like, I know I missed a bunch of stuff in the invented part. Oh God, I yeah. Could have gotten yeah. And, and I was like, I know there's more here. I just don't know what it is. So yeah. If the, if the United States was gonna assassinate a writer or like a, a fiction writer or a poet, <laughs> who, would they, who, who would they assassinate, I wonder? <laughs> like that the government would want not want to exist. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, I guess we could take the current regime, but I mean, I imagine there's ones that like, Multiple regimes would want to have assassin. I'm trying to think who who it would be. A writer, though. Yeah. Do they care enough? Probably I, not. I, I There's like some point in time. other people. Like it's they're too busy. I know. <laughs> like, you know, if we're gonna kill yeah. ideas. Yeah, but at some point in time, they truly did because there's that whole, all that, that long history of the CIA hiring um, like George Plimpton and various other people to work for them to report on. Uh, intellectuals and what they're yeah. thinking and doing, and they, going back to the '68, like that period in time, they definitely wanted to know what like Abby Hoffman or I'm not really a writer, but like um, that whole group of people whose names I'm blanking out on, but what they were up to. Eldridge Cleaver. Eldridge Cleaver. Yeah. Even like the, like Allen Ginsberg, all those kind of like, they were sowing seeds of dissent. And I think that that, that's, a, that's maybe the difference is that you, is how could you really be a writer that sows seeds of dissent now that are like palpable enough to make anyone that worried about the overall structure of power? I don't know. I can't. Well, I know. I know it's Poetry Month, but nobody cares about poetry, so that's not gonna. <laughs> I've been I've been reading poetry all month, man. I found, yeah? I actually yeah, I'm trying my best, and uh, I'm trying. <laughs> it's a real struggle. So, it's a, is that the poetry? I, is that because I feel like I'm always shitting on poetry and don't you publish? Isn't ten percent of your publishing? Uh, catalog a poetry a little less than ten percent, but yeah, okay. yeah, fair enough. Please, Louise, um, dude. And I like, I like it. I respect it, but I don't ever feel like I know how to talk about it or how to appreciate it. But the bigger problem, which I know is absolutely the case, and that's much more um, uh, an issue with me, is that I don't slow down enough to read it. Like I don't, I don't like reading poetry because it's not something that I can consume very fast. Okay. And so I like to read through the books of poetry and that's dumb. Like you don't get anything that way, really. I think not, you, you like, haven't read, I think, yeah, you just need to find, like I haven't found any anything that grabbed me that's been written. Like the most recent was like, oh, uh, Billy Collins. I mean, that's a long, that's, that's a long time ago now, but like, you know, I go back to, you know, Elizabeth Bishop and Henry Reed and, um, and Elliot, you know, and it, it's because that it really, it really is reading like music. And that's really what got me in. Whereas like a lot of poetry that, that I've read that's been published recently, you know, people don't, it doesn't seem like a lot of people are really trying to use any sort of self constraints, you know, like, like rhyming or some sort of meter or some sort of other thing. It's just like, they're just writing their thoughts and, and that makes me frustrated. So yeah. maybe you just need to find the right, the right one that, that stops you, you know, from, from going fast. But I just, I just bring it up because I thought it was interesting that like in these countries, these, like th there's like poetry heroes, right? Like heroes yeah. of the state or are are, are writers or poets, or they'll get assassinated because their ideas are so powerful or strong. And I don't think we have that here necessarily. Like I, I remember reading, um, the first time I encountered this was when I read Bolaño's Distant Star. 
and it's talking mm -hmm. about the 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 hero poet that would skywrite or whatever on an airplane. I I think I have right. that right. I don't know, but it was like well, one. Why do people like a poem? A poetry person can't be a hero. And two, <laughs> <laughs> but like yeah, it's just a, it's a weird thing that seems. Shh, it seems very uh, like un you know United States like un-American to use the term like of something being so important you're gonna get killed over it like here we're just like yeah whatever do your thing we'll do a poetry month and yeah 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 well, let's like, we'll somehow codify it make it like not yeah. dangerous or you know just neuter it in some way well you no know, I mean I I like the idea of it being dangerous or something that scares yeah. the state or offends people or like I think that's if, if it's meaningful I think I think that's a wonderful thing that we're, yeah. we're kind of missing here I think it's back to what you said about how people are so scared to say anything um, yeah, yeah that they're that it's like well I'm going to offend this group of people but you know what you're talking about reminds me of when I um, I read something about um, the Irish uh, I think he just was a dramatist, uh, Jam Sings. Sorry. Jam Sing. Yeah, it's like, yeah. And, and whatever, one of his plays, um, people went to see it and they rioted afterwards. And I was Amazing. like, Man, <laughs> man, when do you go and see something and you're like, you feel that strongly about it that you riot? Dude, I love that play. story. <laughs> I, I love, love it. it. I love that story because it's, yeah, the, the play is the playboy of the Western world. That's it, like, that's it, right. Yeah, and it's all about, like, a guy who says that he's killed his father, and everyone's like, oh, you're awesome. But then they find out that he didn't kill his father, and they're like, oh, fuck you, you're just a fraud. You're just a lying <laughs> Irish sack of shit. And, like, and everyone was like, you're making fun of the Irish. Yeah. <laughs> like, not really, like, being good. They so they ran it and went crazy. They did it yeah. for Sean O'Casey's place, too. But it reminds me, it wasn't that far removed in time. But George Antiel, I think that's how you say his name, the composer, um, uh, classical composer, was in France. And he did a performance in which he hid, like, airplane engines on stage. And in the middle of this performance, there's, like, alarms go off. And there's <laughs> airplane engines. And people lost their goddamn minds. And, like, there's a riot for that, too. And that was a period of time in the 20s and 30s where people would, mm -hmm. yeah, they would absolutely riot and, like, yeah. get all offended or, like, just be like, hell no. Art's meaningful. You can't do it this way. Yeah. Now it's like, eh, it sucked. Let's go, you know, eat dinner or something. Is that poetry yeah, on Twitter poetry. or Instagram? Instagram poetry yeah. is the big thing now. That's what everyone, oh, like that poetry book sold, sold like 300,000 copies. What? There's like an Instagram poet and her book sells them billions of copies or 300,000. Don't tell me these things. Hooray. I'm going to tie this together with poetry, though, for one more second. So we know <laughs> Gospodinov is a poet, and um, this all does fit together. Um, today, I got a package in the mail from Angela Rodell, uh, the translator whose music um, from Splendor and Misery, uh, uh, what's the name of the song again? Oh, Stars and Babies, um, opens and closes the podcast. Well, she sent me her, her CDs. They finally arrived. And this book, which is um, From One Sky to Another Two, translations from Bulgarian into English. And it has a whole poetry section. And I was hoping that it had one of Gospodinov's poems in here, but it doesn't. So, or else I would read that. But it does happen to have the very first one I opened up to is um, a poem that's translated by a Bulgarian translator who's coming here to Rochester in a week <laughs> to do like a three-week residency. So oh, all cool. coincidences, all things Bulgarian, all ties together. I and loved, poetry. I loved Angela's interview. I just, I thought that was great. She seemed, I... I like could listen to her talk about translation. I knew nothing about Bulgarian literature, but it was just fascinating. It was really, I, I was like, wow, I have to go after her. <laughs> just, I mean, it was my fault. Cause I wanted, you know, I said, Oh, I'm not going to be alive until like April. So like, how are you? We'd love to be on this. Well, I don't know that I'll be breathing come April 1st. So <laughs> I, wasn't probably, sure. like... I wasn't sure. I wanted to be honest with you, you know, <laughs> but I really wanted to do it. So I was like, well, the last one, one of the last ones would be great. And then, yeah. I, I think you're doing great. Yeah, Thank I think you. so too. <laughs> I am breathing, so that's good. I, I like this section too because it does sort of hint back towards the, without being so explicit, hints back towards that Minotaur as being the melancholy uh, place because it does have that reference. I guess it comes through the reference to the labyrinth 
that there's the bit about the labyrinth is frustrating because it's not because it's uh there's your where is it the labyrinth is someone's fossilized hesitation the most oppressive thing about the labyrinth is that you're constantly being forced to choose it isn't the lack of an exit but the abundance of exits that is so disorienting of course the city is the most obvious labyrinth Barthes points to Paris as a model, the labyrinths of the center and the outskirts built by Hausmann, and then talks about being lost in the city and all these sort of exits and the choices and the options of that. And that sort of in some way kind of, uh, for me anyways, led back towards the Minotaur and like the idea that the Minotaur is in this labyrinth or that people are people going into the labyrinth are, aren't going to end well either, but he's in there with all these choices, all the space, no way out. Um, and it's constantly stuck there. And in a way, the narrator becomes the minotaur in this section of being in the world of which there's all these places you can go. And every place is a, is a dead end of a hotel room or like an airport um, and isn't going to be satisfying. And you're just there as a sort of like sourful melancholy minotaur. This is a pretty drag of a section. <laughs> well, it, and, now, and I just, while you were talking, I was just looking back at 219 again, directional signs in the museum of fine arts. Yeah, and they're all pointing the same way too. Yep. So you're like, you got your romanticisme, romanticisme, impressionisme, and all that other stuff. And it's all in the toilets. It's all over there, and you know. And so it kind of is. I mean, it's like, well, if they're all over there, where are they? You know. I mean, yeah. once you get there, you know, which now which way do you turn? It's like when we went to the Louvre, um, we we got so lost. I mean, I thought we were going to die there. <laughs> we, got, we got so damn lost that we kept going up to the people and like, I was using French. I know I was speaking French and they just, they knew I wasn't French. So they were just like, really? And I kept saying, where's, I want to go to the street, the street. And they kept saying, you know, next exhibit. And I was like, no, the street. I swear. I don't know how we got out. Oh, you want a Banksy? <laughs> no, I don't. I want to see <laughs> You want to street? I you want, want street to, art? I want to go. <laughs> no, I want to, to leave. I want to get out of here. I want to get the hell out of here. <laughs> Let me go out. Let me get out. I don't know. I think we had to go down to like the bowels of the like the like the Egyptian art, and somehow my husband found like the way out, and we like stumbled out. Like, oh my god, that was close. <laughs> You know, that's just what that reminded me of. And so I guess his, so this book is really, it's very, it's, it's making me remember uh, my experiences with signs as such a labyrinth in the Louvre. And they do it on purpose. They don't want you to leave. No, you just yeah. keep them. They keep don't. It. Just keep you rolling, roaming around forever. <laughs> I think that's the goal, but. There's always every year, every fall, there's one of those stories that comes out of like some family that went to a corn maze in the middle of like <laughs> fucking Ohio and they just, it all goes down and like, and like they're found by a dog three days later. I won't go in those things. I just <laughs> That's traps. I don't, maybe not being from the Midwest, the Midwest people are more used to it. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not doing it. I will never find my way out. Are you kidding? Who was the first person, you know, hey, you know what we ought to do is just uh, <laughs> make a big ass maze in the corn. You know, we're, ain't nobody going to eat corn. We might as well make a maze. <laughs> You're getting a lot of praise on the chat for your accents, Brian. <laughs> oh, thank you. I've been working on them. Yeah. Comedy, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like you want to be semantic. First, you have to build an observation tower in the middle of your flat ass field so you can <laughs> yeah. see where folks are. You have to plow the, like, draw it up. So it's probably like on some, you know, like, you know, giant Denny's menu, drawing up your corn maze or whatever. It's something and, to do. Yeah. Just what just the hell? Do. You could have adopted like 80 kids and, <laughs> you know, fed people, but no, you're going to make a dumb maze in the middle of your field, wasting gas and food and building a tower and. Just so people can get go die and have a dog find them three days later. Yeah. <laughs> yep. uh, this is why we're not this is why we're not assassinating poets in the United States. <laughs> Saddest place in the world. Yeah. <laughs> There's a For corn maze in Henrietta too. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> it's right right next to the Mormon tablets or whatever. We got everything out here. <laughs> it's true. It's very true. Oh man, there was a lot I I identified with in this because you know, like I 
I did yeah. the whole go through Europe thing, and I could, I could definitely identify with that. Uh, when he talks about seeing a fight in person close up for the first time. That's, like my, I ever... that's my line. Okay. Yeah, tell me, do you have a, a fight that... close up story? No, but that's my favorite. My favorite line is that one from this oh, section. Okay. So okay. I'll just give it now because and let you go on. But my favorite one is I now realize that my only experience with fights is from movies and literature. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Which I feel yeah, because go ahead. Oh, it, it feels absolutely true for me. It's like it's like it's like that moment in um some movie Slackers where the guys like. The, yeah. There's the one character that's stuck in the house with all the TV screens, and he's like, "I went outside once, and like I saw this guy get stabbed, and like the blood was all the wrong color, like the tip was just <laughs> way off, is yeah. not real." <laughs> my, yeah, my... I was, I was like, "Why would you even try?" I, you know, I, I really wanted, I, I felt like he was talking to me. I don't know. It just seems so, so much of a conversation. You know, where I was just like, why would you, why would you even get involved? I mean, what drive, you know, I would have run so fast, but then again, you know, it depends on, you know, uh, like your experiences, you know, I think maybe most women would not have gotten involved. You know, maybe if you're a guy, you know, if you are really strong, it would be different than if you weren't. I mean, it, you know, it's kind of like, well, you know, why would you get involved in that whole other, you know, that whole other thing going on that you know you would, I mean, he wound up getting hurt and having to pay for the window. It's like, <laughs> you knew that was going to happen, right? <laughs> I don't know. I actually did. You yeah, just reminded me. I'd forgotten this, but in relation to that, I did see a real fight one time in New York City on the way back from a reading that we had for uh, Braggy Olofsson, the Icelandic author. Um, and I was carrying my backpack with like a ton of books in it. And I saw all these people gathered around and there was a guy punching the shit out of another guy on the, on the ground, just punching him and <sighs> punching him. And the guy on the ground took off his belt like he was going to try and whip the guy punching him. And the guy punching him just grabbed the belt, put it around his neck, cinched it, and started dragging him. And it was a moment of, like, <laughs> looking at other people. And these other people are, like, someone was on the phone calling the cops. But there's this moment of, like, someone needs to physically do something or this person is going to die. And I'm, like, seven feet away maximum. And I've got this bag that weighs easily 30 pounds. And I thought, if I swung and I just brain this guy, like, all I would be a hero and then immediately my second thought was, there's absolutely no fucking way that I would do this right. <laughs> like I would fall. And then his friends would come after you. <laughs> and I would no. be dead. And no. this is a bad idea. I'm staying out of it. And you don't even know what the background of it was. Like, no, maybe he deserved okay. it. You know? I mean, not that it's okay to do that to someone, but, you know. No. <laughs> he might have, like, kicked the guy's dog or something. I mean, who knows? You well, know. I remember I, there was a... Yeah there was a fight that was happening at a house party when we were in high school and, you know, everybody gathers around to watch the fight. And before the fight even got started, somebody came up from behind the other person and they hit him in the head with an empty 40 ounce bottle. And then I, I just clearly remember it made this noise that just went pink, like a golf ball getting hit by a golf, like a driver. Oh. And the, but the That's bottle didn't, but the bottle didn't break. <laughs> he just they like it was a full swing to someone's head and just goes <laughs> dink. And we're just like, oh like everybody like recoil, like that's not how this happened. Like in the movies, it shatters <laughs> and the person falls down, and they were just like, oh, oh my head. Like, and then that was the fun. It was just <laughs> bing, and done. Like, okay, that's nothing like the movies. Yeah, it's just so boring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're just like, oh wow, not good. I actually think though, like I we say that that line of like I, I only know fights from the movies and literature, but I feel like I also, mostly know them from movies. Like I can't think of a really well just defined fight scene from a book. I might just be blanking out though. You're not reading enough commercial fiction. You're only reading literary. God, you're right. That's exactly. Literary people are too refined. You know, they just stab yeah. each other with words. <laughs> if you read, if you read Street Fighter Two fan fiction, I mean, there's some killer fights when Guile goes up against Ryu or something. Like, oh man, jab, jab, well, jab, fierce. I mean, finish. <laughs> about a fight between like a bear and and an old and old ladies. 
What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Seriously. One of the best books I've ever read in my whole life. And I don't, I just, I don't know why, but like, uh, it's called Den- Dendera. Um, it's a Japanese book. And of course, it, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a guy, it's, it's about uh, old women. There's like a ritual in a village where old women are left, who are about to die, are left on a mountain. And they're supposed to just kind of like, <laughs> die. And I don't know. It, it's a way to like, it's a way to like keep the, the people from like sucking in all the resources of the village or whatever. And, um, but instead these, some of these women have decided that they don't want to die. And so they've started this village on a, on a mountaintop and half of the problem is, you know, they have to stay alive somehow. And there's a hungry mama bear and her kid. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. It is the most gory, like detailed and just disgusting, like the bear just like entrails like ripping out and i don't know this is not my thing usually but the book is so amazing but yeah that's what i think of it i think of a fight a bear and an old lady so like i read the book battle royale which i believe was japanese right? as well and it's like seventh grade kids obliterating each other yeah with they're the hardcore book. with the japanese no battle. they're not though because they 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 blur out pornography penetration so like you can't do that but like old ladies can get disemboweled by bears yeah. and seventh yeah. graders yeah. can kill each other with pipe wrenches but oh good god let's <laughs> not look at two people have sex that would be uncouth that is a that is an interesting culture i'll tell you that yeah, <laughs> I, yeah it would take a lot to get used to Yes, it's, just, it's so different. It's we went way off the rails. We're talking about bears killing dead <laughs> ladies. Fun. There's a fight. There's a fight. We yeah. got the fights here. There's a, there's a literary fight. Mm-hmm. That's, how, that's how a book should work, man. Sparks all yeah. kinds of other ideas. Yeah. <laughs> the other part that I the the part that I uh, that that I identified with um, wasn't so much the word choice, but the bit of like running into someone and like, Oh, Hey man, how are you doing? And being like, I have no idea who this is. And like, <laughs> and like <laughs> so much, I feel like that happens to me when I wake up at home some days, but I'm just like, Oh, wait a second. I need to justify who you are. <laughs> like, <laughs> justify, Oh, you're my kid. Justify um, <laughs> your existence. <laughs> that just me. <laughs> Somebody's the wrong words, but the the but that part with that I was gonna I meant to greet you, Brian, when you came back as senior schlong, but I forgot. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's such a that's that's I don't know what that would have been in the original Bulgarian, but I love that senior oh, schlong. Yeah. Is part of this I haven't been called that since I was a Boy Scout leader. <laughs> It, mutually, it, it was mutual. I'm, uh, whatever. No. <laughs> but he, I like how he's saying, like, we're trying. So I'm trying so hard, like, asking all the usual questions while in my head going, who are you? Who the hell are you? <laughs> yeah, this double, like, layer of. And it reminded me of a song. There's a Billy, Billy Joel song where there's, like, a whole second. <laughs> Story song. <laughs> It's a whole section where it's like, I'm great. The kids are great. How are you? Haven't seen you in forever. And it was like the exact same conversation <laughs> that was in here. And I remember thinking, this is the weirdest thing to put in a song. Um, but it might have been ironic. And and this is, yeah, it's the same thing. It's like, maybe you'll give away a clue if I just keep asking you questions. I and guarantee maybe... you Billy Joel was never meant to be ironic. <laughs> I really want to, I want to believe that he was in this. No, case. that's fine. I agree. I think, it'd be, but hell no. <laughs> no. I really hope I, it was. It was just. It was the exact same conversation. How are you, kids? The, the job, the whatever, and I, yeah. Who is this guy? I must think about that uh, Kroll show skit of uh, the the bit the the, <laughs> the the tales of young Billy Joel like every every other week. <laughs> My guys are gonna go off and write my story songs. <laughs> I like Billy Joel. So. <laughs> it's kind of like, it is interesting though, you know, bringing up Billy Joel in this. That uh, there, there's a lot of room for pleasantries in the United States. That like 
you know, depending on if, if you actually had problem, like real hard problems, those pleasantries are gone, right? Like, how are you is like kind of offensive in a way. Like, <laughs> really? You're going to come ask me, like, you know how I am. Like, we both live in the same shithole together. Like, <laughs> what do you mean, how am I? <laughs> we live in the saddest place on earth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, like around here, we're, we're not like, you know, we're not being killed by, you know, drone strikes from the sky and we're not having public beheadings. We, crazy weather we're having today, isn't it? <laughs> You know, like, they have there's a lot of garbage kind of place at Wegmans. I don't even know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, my Wi-Fi has been so spotty. What Wi-Fi do you have? You know, like <laughs> those. Are, I know it's so. It's like, yeah, it's like, oh my god, what happened to my internet? Yeah. Wait a minute. Wait, yeah. is the world ending? Because I mean, it could end. It could be ending. That could be a reason. I can't even <laughs> update my phone for three more months. Like, I'm not even sure. <laughs> I'm just kidding about that. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Are there any other last things that you guys wanted to talk about or bring up, or do you have a favorite line? My favorite, my favorite line was, well, it's not a line, but it's um, it's the whole sequence on two oh six, where oh no no okay oh man I have so many okay never mind <laughs> how goes ugh, I'm gonna do two I'm just gonna do two okay. Uh, the top uh, of 206 is my first you one. Sound just like, you sound just like my wife when we're ordering food. Like, what are you going to order? <laughs> it doesn't matter what just, I'm going to order. Just, just get your do. food. <laughs> just pick what you want. It's just pick it. <laughs> okay. um, I, need, I needed a new shield of Achilles against bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's Perfect. Good pick. And, then, and then below that, uh, how are you? How are you? How are you? How are you supposed <laughs> to answer that? <laughs> yeah. yep. You can just hear it. Like, how am I supposed to answer that stupid question? It's a great page. It's my favorite page. It really is. Right next to that, the one of the the responses that I underlined that I then started was, "We're fine, but it'll pass." <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> I feel like that's my usual Tuesday. And I got the the highly acclaimed ha. Huh. That's a very good, that's, that's very high regards in my note taking. I have hey, hey, if you can see that. Oh, there you go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Brian, do you have a line? Uh, I liked on the, uh, the first paragraph on 223. Uh, the whole evening, I listened to the bed and the room above me creaking and precise, robust I am. A thought crossed my mind and I wrote it down. The cheaper the hotel, the more furious the fucking. <laughs> I like that too. <laughs> And it was only because this was again another thing that like you're hungry. Okay, one moment. Sorry, Daddy said a naughty word. Um, I was staying in a hotel in in San Diego. Cook you some food. Okay, one moment. It's kind of late for food. Go ahead and cook you some food. Okay, you just have to wait one second. I was uh staying in like a super cheap. Yes. Yes, I will. One moment. We're you almost go done. Ahead. You go ahead. You go ahead. Oh, well, apparently I have to go cook food. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> told. This is about but the I, child eating joke. Oh, I know. I I stayed Daddy, in the, the ahead, cheapest go. hotel I could find in all of San Diego, and the people next to me were just going at it all night long, and it was so stinking loud, like <laughs> ridiculously loud. Where like I was just like, all right, cool. Like, it's the walls it what are it thin. Is. It's what, yeah. it's what ha- the walls are thin. And so and, I like I'm like know? creating in my mind who these people are, and like they have to be athletic because like holy cow, the stamina, incredible. <laughs> and then I'm leaving, Daddy, and, and they're coming out. You cook me some food. <laughs> okay, you think you're. So, okay, shh, one second. So after this all night long marathon session they've been doing, they come out and it's like the most overweight, like they have to have like the red cart. Like, how do they do this? This is incredible. Like it was, ex- expe- my expectation what was the reality was completely subverted and I'll never forget it. But yeah, cheap hotel and yeah, it's furious. <laughs> Fast and furious. Oh man. Okay. Um, I guess we can round it there. Uh, one last reminder that next week we'll be back on Mondays. We'll be talking about the next part of the book, which is elementary physics of sorrow. And as always, 
Be sure and check out uh, Santiago's um, post that he's putting up every week on the 3% website. He's getting way into depth into the book, even more so than we are. And and I, with less, less uh, fewer, fewer like off it's topic jokes. Oh, like, so for people who, sorry. Which, which is a great, it's a great, it's a great compliment to what we're doing here. And I, everyone should go check those out, read all of those. We'll put them all into one place um, once they're all finished. But until then, I have nothing else to add, except that Isaac's hungry, Brian. I gotta go, go and make her some food. She's I gotta go so in the kitchen and cute. Brian, I gotta go cook, cook some food right now. Daddy, yes. it's my turn to talk to Chad. Oh, okay. You want to talk to Chad? We'll do it after we're done with the podcast. We have to uh, <laughs> sign off real quick, okay? That's perfect. Take care, guys.